line between ice ages that they first appeared. Fell hungry on the beasts and fish they speared. But all their bones are blackened and their faces are no more. As we walk among the ruins by the shore, they worshipped gods and thought they'd never die. But now the spiders nest the tombs wherein they lie. But all their bones are blackened, and their faces are no more. As we walk among the ruins by the shore. My name is Kerry Ann Mendoza. I'm an independent journalist and author. A quarter of a million people a month read my stories on the Script Tonight daily blog and you can often see me in the TV and radio speaking about things like politics and economics. I've been travelling to Israel and the occupied territories of Palestine since 2002 now and I really knew very little about Israel, Palestine or the conflict before my first trip. I saw a talk at university and the footage that they showed revealed really brutal atrocities and I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard about it on the news. So I went to see for myself. What I saw on that trip led me to make a promise that I would do everything I could to support the Palestinian people in their fight for justice. First I'd like to show you how ostensibly the same thing can be completely transformed by the context in which it happens. Right now, we're looking at water falling from the mouth of a bottle. And we can all agree about what we are looking at. But what none of us has is the context for this event. Water can be life-giving. It could be falling into the mouths of an African child and saving their life. Or it could be falling onto a towel pressed over the face as part of torture. In each case, the same thing is happening. Water is falling from a bottle. But the context in which that water falls is absolutely decisive. One is a lifeline and one could be a death sentence. The same rules apply when looking at Israel and Palestine. Although we can gather facts, the context in which these facts are placed, the way Western politicians and pundits place these facts means that we can see the same facts but come to dramatically different conclusions. This film is not your typical film on Israel and Palestine. I'm not just going to throw facts at you. For the next 90 minutes, you will see the Israel and Palestine we never see. You will not only see the brutal reality of this conflict, the summary executions, the destruction of civilian homes, hospitals and infrastructure, and mass murder, but you will understand why. This is not an easy film to watch. You may want to turn away or turn it off. But I ask you not to turn your back. I ask you to put aside your own opinions and for the next 90 minutes see the Israel-Palestine conflict from a perspective you may never have even imagined before. We are dealing with a real estate dispute in which Israel had confiscated the rights and the lands of the Palestinians and uh, refuses to return them. As simple as this. It is not a complex dispute. It's a very simple one with very clear black and white, with very clear just and unjust 
and all the rest is ways to cover it up, to deny it, and to say that Israel is human and liberal, and they are those wild natives. Listening to Western news reports, you'd be forgiven for imagining Israel here, Palestine here, and two states in conflict. But Israel and Palestine are the same place. In fact, Israel only exists in the place of Palestine due to an idea, and that idea is Zionism. Zionism began as a secular political movement in the late 19th century. The Zionist movement looked at various potential homelands before settling on Palestine, an Arab nation under British occupation. Zionists such as Israel Zangville began a myth. Palestine is a country without a people and the Jews are a people without a country. However, Palestine had a thriving society, economy and culture long before Israel ever existed. Cameraman employed by the Lumiere brothers filming at Jerusalem station provide the first moving pictures taken in Palestine. From now on, the camera is a recording eye, and what it records is this. A society much like that of Cairo, Damascus, or Beirut, in an Arab city much like any other. By the end of the 19th century, Palestine has 500,000 inhabitants, of whom 30,000 live in Jerusalem. A veiled woman, a sunny Muslim, one of the majority. An Orthodox Jew, he too turns away from the camera. Here we have an Armenian Pope. Each of the Christian denominations has its church here in the Holy City. The holy places of the three religions are scattered across a few hundred square meters. The great mosque is close to Christ's tomb. Further along, at the foot of the Wailing Wall, a Jew is reciting a prayer. He is wearing a Turkish tabush, and though he prays in Hebrew, his everyday language is Arabic. Jews form half the population of Jerusalem, but in the country as a whole, they make up less than 5% of the total. Christians account for 10% and Muslims 85%. Under the British mandate system, Palestine could have become a self-governing state for all its citizens. But the Balfour Declaration in 1917 changed all this. Despite a British census revealing Palestine was populated by 700,000 Arabs and just 56,000 Jews, Lord Balfour promised Palestine to the Zionists. When it looked like the British might renege on this promise, Zionist militant groups began launching terror attacks against the British in Palestine. One such attack was the bombing of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in July 1946. This attack killed 91 people, including the British High Commissioner. The architect of this attack was Ergun member Menachem Begin, who would later become Prime Minister of Israel as would Stern Gang terrorist leader Yitzhak Shamir. Despite decades-long efforts by the Zionist movement to encourage Jewish migration to Israel and the horrors of the Nazi Holocaust, by 1947, just 6% of the land of Palestine was owned by Jews and Jewish people made up just 33% of the population. But nevertheless, in 1947, the UN partition plan gave over 56% of Palestine as the Jewish state. This plan was rejected by Palestinians and their Arab neighbours, but embraced by Zionists. Zionist militias such as the Stern Gang and the Urgun then began the systematic ethnic cleansing of Arabs from the lands designated as the Jewish state. This plan was called Plan Dalit, or Plan D. It was worked out by the Jewish paramilitary organisation, the Haganah, in March of 1948. And this is a quote taken directly from Plan D. 
These operations can be carried out in the following manner. By destroying villages, by setting fire to them, by blowing them up and by planting mines in their rubble. In case of resistance, the armed forces must be wiped out and the population expelled outside the border of the state. This plan gave rise to the Nakba. 750,000 Arabs were expelled. Zionist forces committed 33 massacres. 531 Palestinian towns were destroyed entirely. Israel unilaterally declared itself a state on May 14, 1948, and the US recognised that Israeli state the next day. Meanwhile, Arabs continued to flee to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Even according to the UN partition plan, even according to the Balfour Declaration, it is the first one to violate these because they had to safeguard the rights of those people who were living here, of all the cities, all religions and so on. The first thing they did is to kick out the people from here even before the creation of the state. So this artificially created Jewish majority in this state, which is focusing on that, yep. it treats anyone, all the others as the enemy. Any Palestinian born here in Israel is regarded as a security threat. Simply for procreating, or simply for living here, yeah. they are regarded as a threat to the state. That tells you just how crazy this place is. The Nakba of 1948 and the continuing occupation and oppression of Palestinians to this day has one cause. Palestinians are the wrong race and from the point of view of Zionists, simply do not belong. The actions of Israel are not and never were in response to a security threat. All of these actions are essential to fulfil the original and continuing goals of Zionism, a Jewish state on all the historical land of Palestine. The entire plan was conceived and laid out by leading Zionist Ben Gurion in a letter to his son Amos in 1937. My assumption, which is why I am a fervent proponent of a state, even though it is now linked to partition, is that a Jewish state on only part of the land is not the end but the beginning. The establishment of a state, even if only on a portion of the land, is the maximal reinforcement of our strength at the present time, and a powerful boost to our historical endeavours to liberate the entire country. We shall admit into the state all the Jews we can. We firmly believe that we can admit more than two million Jews. We shall build a multifaceted Jewish economy, agricultural, industrial and maritime. We shall organize an advanced defense force, a superior army, which I have no doubt will be one of the best armies in the world. At that point, I am confident that we would not fail in settling in the remaining parts of the country through agreement and understanding with our Arab neighbours or through some other means. In my point of view, Israel could never be a democracy because it prefers Jews or non-Jews. We, the Palestinians in Israel, we did not immigrate to Israel. Historically, what happened is that Israel immigrated to us and we were living here. And then huge numbers of people were immigrating to our home. In the 1948 war, they expelled us. Because we were born to the wrong race from their point of view. We were not Jewish. If it prefers Jews on non-Jews, it could never bring equality between the citizens. Now, without equality, there is no democracy. Not to mention all the racist policies that you have towards the Arab-Palestinian minority. In all things of life, you can think. So Israel is probably the only country in the world that doesn't recognize its own nationality for a reason. Yeah. Everything was done here in order to segregate and separate. My citizenship is Israeli, but my nationality is Jewish, according to the state. So there are pretty much four nationalities inside 48, inside yeah. Israel, that are being acknowledged by the Ministry of Interior. That's Jewish, Arab, Circassian, and Druze. None of them are Israeli. Well, 
it was the Supreme Court. It was challenged actually. And the Supreme Court gave its verdict, basically saying that they denied the appeal, and they stated that uh, acknowledging an Israeli nationality would, un would undermine the very character of the state of Israel. I was, I, I was a history teacher. Mm -hmm. In Israel, there are three different education systems, three different official education systems. One for the Arabs, one for the secular Jews, and one for the religious Jews. Now, we are not allowed to write our programs. We are not allowed to control our education system. According to the Israeli law, we don't have history. And as a history teacher, I had to teach Zionist history to my students. You see this crazy discrimination in all fields of life. Less than 10% of the population in Israel are sharing the same space. The vast majority are living on, on total separation. And most of the world, by the way, don't know Israel. Uh, separation is a little bit worse than the apartheid. So the West Bank in the 1994-1997 to Oslo Interim Agreement was divided into three areas. So there's Area A, Area B and Area C. In theory, Area A is controlled entirely by the Palestinian Authority. Area B is controlled half by the Palestinian Authority and half by the um, Israeli authorities. And Area C is controlled by completely by the Israeli authorities, which constitutes over 60% of the West Bank area. So I'm sure you've heard about the wall or the separation barrier. So it started to be built by the Israelis in the early 2000s um, to protect its citizens from terrorist attacks or suicide bombings. By 2003, 180 kilometers of the wall had been built. The thing is that the wall doesn't actually surround all of the West Bank and there are sections where you can still get from the West Bank to Israel, albeit illegally. So it's confusing how it is actually protecting the security of Israelis. Um, at the moment, the wall is twice as high and twice as long as the Berlin Wall was, but it is not completed yet. Within the West Bank, there are other restrictions such as roadblocks, earth mounds, trenches, flying checkpoints, which can pop up, um, controlled by the Israeli army. Um, whereas Isra um, illegal Israeli settlers who live in settlements and settlement outposts, like the ones around Yanin, are able to come and go in and out of the West Bank as they please. Throughout the West Bank, um, near settlements and settlement outposts, um, there's roads that are deemed only for Israelis to use. Um, you can also see the differences with the road signs. If you look at a map, you can see that most of the road signs you see only direct you to settlements. It seems that they're trying to make sure that Palestinians are not visible in the West Bank to those that are travelling around. So you can see there's quite a split in how different people are treated within the occupied West Bank, um, even though the split of the population is 2.7 million Palestinians and 520,000 settlers. And while the West Bank is cut up into tiny prisons, village by village, by the separation barrier, the Gaza Strip lies over on the west coast of Israel-Palestine, completely enclosed in a giant apartheid wall of its own. The Gaza Strip is home to 1.8 million Palestinians. One million of those are under the age of 18. Israel controls the Gaza Strip by air, land and sea and for the last seven years has maintained a complete embargo, meaning that even the most basic of goods and services is not allowed in or out of the Israeli-controlled perimeter. Those flashing lights, that's the top of the apartheid wall that acts as the barrier between Gaza and the rest of the world. How on earth can the Jewish state be anti-Jewish? First of all, it was founded by a secular nationalistic movement, a Zionist movement, which was anti-Jewish. It treated the ultra-Orthodox 
and the Orthodox in general of Europe at the time uh, in the most racist way. And they were very much, they were staunch anti Zionists at the time. Nowadays, less so, but still there's a, a significant number of ultra Orthodox that, that see Zionism, Zionism as the greatest threat to Judaism. And they're right about that. It is. The hegemony is uh, comprised of the uh, uh, white uh, 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 community. In Israel, it's the white Jewish community. I know that from outside Israel, uh, people are not aware of the Mizrahi struggle, and people think that you know all the Jews are the same, and there is um, a dominant um, oppression from Jews to non-Jews. Mizrahi is a term for uh, Jews in Israel that our origin is from Arab uh, or Muslim or African countries. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, my family arrived to Israel in the 1930s from Iran. The Jews has uh, privileges in Israel, but if you are a white Ashkenazi Jew, that your origin is from you know Europe or United States, uh, for that matter, from the Western uh, mm -hmm. world. And if you are a Jewish, that your origin is from Arab, Muslim, or African countries, you are oppressed. Israel has for years run an immigration policy which involved the secret and compulsory sterilization of female Jews of color. The Ethiopian Jews are perhaps Israel's best kept secret. The state which defines itself as a safe haven for the world's Jews has a decidedly frosty reception for Jews which happened to be black. When Israel finally started to let some in, they were thrown into an eye-watering bureaucracy. This involves going through state-run absorption centres which manage every inch of their lives in Israel. It was at these absorption centres that Ethiopian women were given contraceptive injections without their knowledge in state efforts to prevent the procreation of black Jews in Israel. It became clear that the gynaecologists were using the Depo Provera contraceptive on Ethiopian immigrant women without their consent, but through force and coercion. When these allegations were first made, the Israeli state responded with contemptuous denials, but was later forced through overwhelming evidence to admit to the disgraceful practice. In questioning why a nation founded in the blood and horror of the Holocaust would employ such a policy of eugenics, one must look only to the comments of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Speaking on immigration, he claimed it would, quote, threaten our existence as a Jewish and democratic state. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background leading up to it, uh, the last five years since Netanyahu was re-elected to Prime Minister, just a, a few of the uh, extreme incidents of incitement. So you have the chief rabbi of the holy city of Tzfat, Shmuel Eliyahu, who openly calls for killing a million, up to a million Palestinians in this discourse. In 2010, he organized hundreds of chief rabbis around the country. These are all uh, rabbis on the public payroll, paid from my taxes, of course, um, to author a religious edict. And according to this edict, it instructed Jewish people that they are forbidden by law to sell or to even rent apartments to non-Jews and Palestinians specifically. Sometimes it's very clear cut and anyone can decipher it, and other times it's coded language. So when he says, give them no respite, they're talking about Deuteronomy chapter 7, which is specifically a call for ethnic cleansing. It's specifically a call to enter the land and drive out all of the non-Israelite people in the land. So these rabbis are specifically making reference to that as their justification, okay? Um, you have, in the last few years, also state-funded rabbi Yitzhak Shapira authoring a book called The King's Torah. Uh, which essentially breaks down the question, under which conditions is it permissible to murder Palestinians, to kill Palestinians? 
essentially, the conclusion he comes to is just about every circumstance, even Palestinian babies, if you can imagine that. Again, these are state-funded rabbis and no repercussions. They don't go, they aren't tried, they aren't you know, charged or brought to court for these kinds of statements. So this is in the lead up to the war. Uh, of course, infamously, Ovadia Yosef, he just, uh, according to him, uh, he was quoted as saying that Goyim, which is a term for non-Jewish people, were born only to serve us. Without that, they have no place in the world. And about Palestinians specifically, or Arabs rather, you must send missiles to annihilate them. So again, this is not a marginal character. His funeral was attended by 800,000 people. It was the largest funeral in the history of the country by far. So you understand how popular views like this become. Um, it's not only coming from religious figures, you also have political figures who are ostensibly secular, like the mayor of Upper Nazareth, Shimon Gapsa, who openly says, yes, we're not gonna build any, 20% of the population of this town is Palestinian, but he says, no, we're not gonna allow any Arab-speaking schools, and proudly proclaims in an op-ed in Haaretz, yes, I am a racist, I'm proud of it, and, and, and there's, there's no shame around it. Danny Danon, uh, up-and-coming lawmaker, just now, until recently deputy defense minister of the country, says the biggest problem in the state of Israel is the Arabs of Israel. So with proclamations like this from religious and uh, political officials, this is, and, and nothing being done to, to stem the tide, just people are pushed into a rage. I mean, it's already on the streets. And true, fair enough, a lot of the time we think of the people who initiate street-level violence as being like, you know, young adolescent males, football hooligans, and sure enough, you go to any football stadium, especially in Jerusalem, and you'll see signs and chants, like right here, no Arabs, we'll be pure forever, okay? And of course, death to the Arabs, chants it. Uh, uh, that's the main problem, because the problem is not, are not the bullies, and not those extremists who write those terrible things in the social media. The problem starts from the mainstream, from the government, of anti-democratic legislations, of uh, the most nationalistic right-wing government, of a collaborating media. All those things, including the dehumanization of the Palestinians in the Israeli media and the demonization of the, Israel, of the Palestinians. The total ignorance about the substance of democracy, the meaning of democracy. In Israel, there is total ignorance. People have no idea what does it mean to be a democratic state mm. or a democratic society. So all this came now in, in its most ugly expression. It is, again, it's a process. It can still become worse. It will get worse because there's no one to stop it. And that's the main danger. There's no one in Israeli society who can really stop it. The fascist uh, movement in Israel is white. All the fascist leaders are white. Okay? They, they created 90% of them, more than 90% of them, created the fascist uh, spirit here. 90% of the people who are serving in the West Bank are from uh, the, the per periphery uh, zones. They are doing the, the, the occupation work. And the white Jews are in the elite units. It is 100% fascist, and I would argue also with some Nazi elements. And I'll give you an example for that. I'm not just saying it from like the McGonagall or anything. Yep. The situation is that 95% of the water in Gaza is not fit for human consumption. So some people actually made that decision that <clears throat> the situation in Gaza should be like that, that 95% of the water is, is toxic. The Ministry of Defense actually went as far as formulating formulas for counting the caloric intake of people in Gaza. And they even made amendments to the formulas saying that, well, you know, Palestinians, they don't need so much fresh fruit and vegetables, they need more white flour and sugar and oil. The Nazi-esque type of mentality that I'm talking about. Where people actually 
go as far as counting the caloric intake for people for the 1.8 million people living in the largest open air prison. And no one here reacts to that. No one thinks that this is outrageous. Beyond outrageous. That's that's beyond criminal. No. On the 12th of June 2014, three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped while hitchhiking in the West Bank. They were Naftali Frankel, 16, Gilad Shayer, also 16, and Eyal Yifra, aged 19. Within days, Israeli investigators knew that they had been killed and the rough whereabouts of these victims' bodies. But instead of informing the public, Israeli authorities continued the pretense that the teens were held captive, creating a national trauma. Despite having no evidence, the Israeli authorities laid the blame for the kidnap squarely on Hamas, the government of the Gaza Strip, claiming it as an act of terrorism. In the following week, the Israeli military raided 1,150 locations in the occupied West Bank, including homes, charities, universities and offices, and detained 330 Palestinians. Israeli soldiers also shot and killed several Palestinian civilians, including 13-year-old Mohammed Dadin. In the few hours and the days and the weeks that followed the discovery of these teenagers' bodies, you had Israelis from across the society posting selfies of themselves with messages advocating vengeance, revenge, and essentially murdering Palestinians. So, you know, that's the point where we're at, where it's acceptable for any segment of society, and it's not just men, it's women too, calling for posting their revenge selfies. This one went around, made the rounds quite a bit. Hating Arabs isn't racism, it's values. So you have people heading into the streets and combing the streets all across the country, but especially in Jerusalem, and you know, chanting death to the Arabs, chanting, demanding revenge, you know, just mobs of people, dozens, hundreds of people screaming this. And at this critical moment, what does the Prime Minister choose to do? Call for vengeance. Sure enough, vengeance for the blood of a small child, Satan has not yet created. I guess that's his way of saying the worst will befall these people. You know, feeding the fire, and that's exactly what he did. Netanyahu's words were the fuel for the fire of Muhammad Abu Khdeel, who was grabbed in front of his parents' home, beaten, gasoline poured down his throat, and he was burnt to death from the inside out. Now, after it happened, more incitement. What do you see on the internet? This passed around. It's a message saying, here's the Arab fag who was murdered by Arabs over family honor, but the left blames us. So quickly there's a narrative on the Israeli right. Oh, not only you know, are these Arab people evil, but they're trying to pin on us the fact that we killed them. And in fact, it was the Arabs themselves who killed them because this is you know, feeding homophobia, feeding into the racism and coalescing in a, a potent... Uh, cocktail of hatred, and of course it turned out that this was the man who did it, who again admitted it to the police, apparently there's a confession, uh, it's not apparently, it's been re released to the media, it's, it's, it's no secret. This man and a group of other Jewish Israelis uh, savagely murdered Muhammad Abu Khdeel. And what happened afterwards? You would think that people would be ashamed that a group of Jewish Israelis went and burnt a Palestinian boy to death. And sure, some people were ashamed, but not everyone, far from it. People, again, posting on Facebook without any shame. It's no shame to burn an Arab. It's a good deed to burn Arabs. This woman wrote on her Facebook, a young Arab's body was found charred in a Jerusalem forest. I want to marry whoever did it. No shame. Prior to these mass arrests and killings, Hamas had maintained a 13-month ceasefire, firing no projectiles towards Israel. With the West Bank on fire, 
hundreds of Palestinians falsely imprisoned and some dead, Hamas renounced its end of the ceasefire. Israel used this as the pretext to launch a full-scale air and ground assault on the Gaza Strip with Operation Protective Edge. When speaking about munitions, it's in my view that you cannot speak about it in isolation. You have to speak about the tactical rationale for the use, overuse, or misuse of munitions. You may even have to speak about the strategic rationale for the use of munitions. It's also necessary to speak about doctrinal and rules of procedure and rules of engagement matters to justify or explain uh, the use of these munitions. And finally, it's necessary to enter into a discourse about the consequence of the use of these munitions. Well, uh, Dahir is a district in southern Beirut uh, occupied by Shia, uh, who are considered to have been sympathetic to the Hezbollah uh, message. And Dahia gave rise then to a doctrine of uh, over-response. To create, in the idea of some of the theorists or the applicators of this doctrine, it was to create a lasting memory of the consequences of their actions by over-responding. And um, the idea was that, for example, if a village in South Lebanon, in South Lebanon harbored one sniper or one member of Hezbollah, the entire village would have to pay the, the consequences. I just want to ask a follow-up question, and that is that that doctrine, in fact, focuses on the civilian, non-competent population. Absolutely. So it isn't a military objective at all? No. It's a punishment. It's a consequence. Uh, and uh, as one general says, to make and create a lasting impression of consequences in the minds of those that are targeted. You can see behind me a mosque lays in ruins, struck by F-16 missiles and shells. I'm because as you will see is, there isn't, frankly, much left behind. So this is a town under immense strain and immense pressure. Almost everyone here is reliant on emergency food aid and water to sustain themselves. People are living in makeshift tents next to their homes, which are mostly reduced to rubble. His name is Shawgi and Najjar. He lives in Khza. They don't leave the water in the street, they don't leave the electricity, they don't leave anything, the mosque. So basically everything that makes a town a town, they destroyed. The first is the house being destroyed, his uncle being dead, his uh, brother being dead, his son of brother being dead. She, uh, he wanted to tell me that maybe hundreds of names. His name is Suad Lafi she lives in Khuzaa. She has a baby inside. She is in an uh, eighth month. Right eight now. Months. Yeah. And are they, uh, where do they live now? Uh, I get to okay for one guy. Eight months pregnant, and this is her home. This is where they live. This woman and her seven children. They all live here. And what happens when she has the baby? Where do they go when she has the baby? Is the baby going to be born here? She will stay here. She said that we will stay here and we will dig here. No problem. We will not go out anywhere. You tell her she's one of the bravest women I've ever met. Alhamdulillah. On the evening of July 19, the Golani Brigade of the Israeli army entered Sajaya neighborhood with the decision 
to conquer the neighborhood, to occupy the neighborhood. The orders were very simple, to occupy the neighborhood, and the mindset was very simple. There will be no resistance. Just like in 2012 and in 2009, most of the Israeli soldiers that will die will be from our fire, from friendly fire. This is what they believe in the army, in the night of the attack on Sajaiya. Sajaiya, a very poor and populated uh, neighborhood in the east of Gaza City, um, one of the most populated in Gaza, almost 100,000 people in the neighborhood, is being entered by the Gulani Brigade, but they didn't believe that the resistance will come. But resistance did come, this operation. Resistance did come, and it was very powerful. In 19 of July 2014, in the, between 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., this first armored vehicle, M113, was attacked by a missile of resistant group inside Sajaya, killed seven soldier, soldiers immediately. In other uh, attacks in different places of Sajaya in the battle, six more soldiers will die. 13 Golani Brigade soldiers in one day. The country was in shock. The army was in shock. The pressure in Israel was very strong, and the Prime Minister and the Minister of Security, Moshe Yalon, decided to respond immediately that evening. Moshe Yalon, the Minister of Security, said, we will take off the gloves. A very high officer in Israel said, we will use the Dachia tactic to the local press in Israel, just killing everybody in sight as a collective punishment of something they, they did to us. Immediately, they decided to do it to Sajaya and everything that moves. In the first few hours of this operation conquered Sajaya, or what we know today as the Sajaya massacre. According to Israel, there was at least 600 shells firing, most of them with depleted uranium inside of them. I believe in my research that I'm doing that depleted uranium is very dangerous material. It will cause you to burn all over your body. And if you're not dead in the spot, it will cause cancer, leukemia, different kinds of diseases in the years to come at the place where it fall. More than that, the Israeli army itself, officials in it, are saying that at least 120 one-ton bombs were dropped on Sajaiya in a matter of seven hours. That's one 120 ton bombs in 120 different targets. And this is the estimate of the Israeli army. The Pentagon was last, uh, how should we say, caution. The Pentagon report from just a few weeks ago is saying that there was 11 battalions deployed 258 artillery, artillery pieces shooting 7,000 shells into the neighborhood. 4,800 of these shells were shot in the first seven hours. <laughs> I got this with his house. Yeah. It's not house now. This is bedroom. They said that you have to take every photo here. Because they need that everybody in the world see that. This is a ceiling. Yeah. Imagine this is your home. 
This is the toilet. It's clearly uninhabitable now. This would have been a beautiful home. In Khuza, just east of Khan Yunus, um, where the worst massacres occurred, multiple witnesses described to me soldiers gathering locals in the center of town as they occupied the area on July 23rd, then asking if anyone spoke Hebrew. When a 55-year-old man who hasn't been identified to me, but who was described to me by multiple witnesses, um, stepped forward to answer in the affirmative that he spoke Hebrew, they shot him in the heart in front of everyone assembled. And, and how did they die? Does he know how they died? Was it, was it in shelling? Or? <laughs> He said that uh, her uncle, maybe his age is 107. Wow. She is very old. She come out and uh, say like this, that uh, I'm not in you, nothing. He wanted to leave. They shot him. And his brother come out and he wanted to go out. And they see him and shot him. But he's not being dead. But they still three, t three days in the street. And he asking, help me, help me in three days. They call ambulance, but the ambulance can't come here. They try and try and try, but they can't, and they're dead in the street. Muhammad Tawfiq Igdeh, he's 65 year old man. Uh, on the 25th of July, it was a Friday, when Muhammad's uh, home was attacked by the Israeli military. This time the Israeli soldiers actually got inside the houses. They break inside his house. I met with Ragad after um, the attack. Uh, his niece Ragad was telling me the story of what happened exactly, one of the most terrifying uh, events that could happen to the family. They were sitting in a basement taking shelter. Um, of course there was the Israeli F-16s that were flying overheads in different parts of the Gaza Strip. The family had to flee inside this basement thinking that they are safe. Most of the neighbors tried to come in. Then an Israeli bulldozer came from the side, smashing the entrance of the building. There were five houses here. Now there's just sand. They were destroyed by Israel. Ragad tried to negotiate with the with the soldiers. The moment she asked an Israeli soldier, we want to go to the toilet, he says to them, no, you better do it in yourself. Muhammad has the, he was fortunate to speak four languages, English, Hebrew, Arabic, and Spanish. But that did not protect him. One of the Israeli soldiers came from a short range, and we're talking about two meters, just the distance between us, it's even less. Like this, and then boom, killed him immediately. That's Muhammad Qudayh, who was executed in front of all his family members. He said, he said that uh, there had a woman, the, and uh, her child, yeah. and when he walking, the Israeli shot her child when he hand and and the Israeli said that you should leave it here. They and shot her baby yeah. in her arm. Yes, after this, leave it. Yeah. yeah, now leave it. They said that you shot him. I have to get to the hospital. He said no, leave it here. So he should leave it and go. He said her son died on her eyes. One of the 89 families completely liquidated by Israeli forces during Operation Protective Edge. 89 families so badly decomposed they had to bury them with a bulldozer in a mass grave conjuring images of some of the darkest times in European history the vast majority of bullet wounds they found in the victims they retrieved were to the head and the chest shoot to kill in Khuza, locals described to me witnessing hundreds of casualties as Israeli soldiers attacked those fleeing the town during the six-day siege among them was 
Adia Rogela, a 16-year-old epileptic girl blown out of her wheelchair by a tank shell as she fell behind her family fleeing on the road leading out of town. From a medical point of view, uh, there is no doubt that uh, the human costs of the current aggression or onslaught attack on Gaza uh, were much worse that they would have, than they would have been uh, if the hospitals and the clinics had been protected as they should have been according to international law. I've been working with medical solidarity with the Palestinians since 1981. And I've been in Gaza during the last four attacks. People tend to forget uh, Operation Samarane in 2006. I was there in 2009, uh, 2012, and now recently during uh, uh, the last attack, uh, the, the last onslaught. The context of hospital damage in a mass casualty medical disaster is, is important to understand because when you have an unbalance, an unbalance between the, the capacity to treat the wounded and the flow of wounded, the, the, the amount of wounded, of course you will increase mortality. This is what we call a, a mass casualty or a medical disaster when this capacity to treat is less than the need for treatment. Normally, we see these situations in disasters, in natural disasters, like Haiti or in earthquake or in tsunamis. But everything we see in Gaza is 100% man-made, deliberate, executed, and controlled by the Israeli government, the Israeli army, with full support from the US. This is one or two siblings, two brothers. This is Seshaya, the horror night of Seshaya. Shifa had, we had 400 patients coming to Shifa that night. 400 patients. Shifa is a hospital with very little water with very limited supplies of disposables, medical uh, instruments, uh, drugs, and everything, and uh, two generators, because the bombers, the attackers, the seizures, the occupant, also cuts electricity and all sorts of energy to the same people as they are bombing. And that has quite serious consequences for hospital. A double amputation, very typical uh, from the first part of the attack when they used uh, aerial bombardment, could also have been uh, from a, a huge artillery grenade. Both legs are, are chopped off at the level of just below the knee on this one and above the knee on this one. He is, of course, in life danger. He will die if he doesn't uh, have a capacity to meet him, to stop the bleeding, do the surgery, and, and save him from bleeding to death. Shrapnel to the neck, very diligent surgery, two teams working on that one, saving his life and saving him from having a, a, a brain infarction. And behind me, to my right, you have Beit Hanunal Hospital, which the Israeli forces actually attacked during Operation Protective Edge. So the hospital were called up and warned that if they, uh, they had to leave, the hospital was going to be attacked. They attacked it, several people were killed and injured and they've since been warned that if they return to hospital and try to treat people they'll be bombed again so that's a whole hospital serving a whole community which has been obliterated now out of use and the people that would have been using that hospital now have to travel across to al Shifa hospital which is miles away many people here no longer have their cars because they've been blown up as well it's a nightmare situation this uh, is from actually from one of the UN uh, Orcha snapshots. It's summing up 11,231 wounded. Among them, 3,500 children, 3,500 women, almost 500 elderly. In the same report, you have this one showing that 62 hospitals and clinics have been damaged. Now, of course, this will be a huge imbalance in a system that has been deprived of supplies, renewing, upgrading, training, everything for seven years. The public health care sector, hospitals, primary health care system, was actually down on its knees before this attack started because of the siege. Um, 47 ambulances were hit and destroyed, 14 completely destroyed, 33 partially damaged. We also had killed paramedics, very brave people coming into Shifa, dead on arrival, some of them badly injured, uh, while doing their duty for their people. Nobody has been punished in Israel for the attacks on the health facilities in 2006, 9, 13, and probably will not be in 14. And then on top of this comes two things. Number one, the huge influx of wounded that we have seen some examples of. 
and the destruction of the capacity of the medical system. It's unbelievable. And it's unbelievable that the State of Israel gets away with it. Nobo nobody felt safe anywhere. Uh, nothing was safe. You were not safe in an ambulance, in a, in a local primary health care clinic, uh, in a hospital, in a hospital for disabled, in a, a pediatric hospital. Nowhere you were safe because of the character of the attack of the Israelis. The heroes are the staff in the hospitals and the pre-hospital medical services in Gaza. They have my extreme admiration and respect. They are never leaving their posts. Don't forget that the staff in the public healthcare sector in Gaza has been denied normal payment, normal wages for one year now. The last five months, they have had zero salaries. Before that, they had 50% salaries due to the fact that Israel, together with the US, allowed a blockade of the payment of the public servants in Gaza, 44,000 people, for a year. They are going to work for nothing, and still they go to work. If you want to learn about discipline, about moral, and about sacrifice, go to Gaza. Habouj, a manager of the Habouj Brothers soap manufactory in Gaza City, uh, that is located very close to the Mediterranean Sea coast, and he was informed by the IDF that uh, his uh, soap manufactory will be uh, destroyed uh, within 10 minutes and he and his staff had 10 minutes to leave the compound and after 10 minutes a missile of a F-16 fighter jet was hitting this uh, soap manufactory and uh, when I spoke with Maha, Maha Habush on the next day about this uh, attack he told me that he assumes that the value of destroyed machines is more than two million US dollars. And uh, he does not have an, any idea why his manufactory was uh, attacked. But uh, as I will tell you now, this is just one of more than 220 factories that were completely destroyed and more than a few hundreds that were demolished. Uh, in 2007, a law passed in Israel that defines Gaza as enemy territory and prohib prohibits compensations for losses inflicted up to them by the IDF. So no businessman can, can ask for compensation when his factory or manufactory was destroyed. And this is a dead a cow. This is one of 130 cows that were killed during a missile attack at the farm of the family of Al Fayumi, also located in Jabalia, or close to Jabalia. And uh, the Al Fayumi family had 150 cows and 130 of them were killed during this attack. And uh, a member of the Al Fayumi family who talked to me after the attack told me that none of his cows were members of the Hamas and, and none of his cows were terrorists. Uh, this is really a, a big problem for all the families that were fed by, by the people who worked in these manufactories. I spoke to the social economist Musen, Musen Abu Ramadan, the director of the Arab Center for Agricultural Economic Development in Gaza. And he told me, I would like to quote him, Israel, Israel is not only attacking systematically civilians and their homes, but also systematically destroying the economy of the Gaza Strip in order to make people dependent on emergency aid. But we will have heard um, ad nauseam the Israeli uh, spokesman say that they attacked facilities where there were rockets being sent. So I, I feel we have to ask you, did you see rockets being sent from hospitals and what were your thoughts if you did? The answer is no. I've never seen any rocket shot from any hospital that I've been attending to. and. Um, if I, if I might add one thing, this question about human shields, we know there are numerous examples of the Israelis using Palestinians as, as human shields in the true sense. But if you know Palestinian culture and the Palestinian family values and their religion, nobody in Palestine, no family, no village, no nobody would accept that any Palestinian fighter 
would take a, a, a man, a woman, a child in front of them to do any military advance. It's simply impossible. So all this, all this uh, rhetorics about taking, you know, the, the Palestinian civilians as human shield, it's, it's utter nonsense. And if any have, anybody has done that, it is the Israeli army, which has actually been proven. In Huza, members of the Najjar family told me how soldiers forced him to stand at opposite corners of their roof for a full day, while the soldiers sniped at their neighbors attempting to evacuate. This is the Black Tuesday of the 22nd of July. And this is the Imam of Al-Mosque, Khuza'a Mosque, Khalil Al-Najjar, 55-year-old. He was just sitting home together with his family when a number of Israeli tank shells hit the home. That's a case not of execution with the Imam. He survived. But it was a different case of humiliation and using him as a human shield. He was taken by the group of soldiers in front of all the women that gathered around the neighborhood. They put, the Israeli military put the women and the children on one side and the men on the other side. And then there is the Imam. He was basically naked at gunpoint and the Israeli troops tried to take him all the way to the mosque. The message was to tell all young people in Khuza to get outside of their homes and they will be safe. But when, they, when he called for all young people to get outside, then suddenly hundreds of those young people are outside in the roads. And then they were trapped from everywhere by the military. And those young people who were taken, all of them naked at gunpoint, Um, the invasions of Shujaia and Rafa had already exacted a devastating toll on the residents when they were initiated, but the death tolls and the levels of destruction spiked dramatically when Israeli forces invoked a semi-secret policy um, known as the Hannibal Directive. This policy is named after the Carthaginian general who chose to poison himself rather than be held captive by the enemy. And that explains what it is. It was established in 1986 following the Jibril Agreement, a prisoner exchange in which Israel traded 1,150 Palestinian prisoners for three Israeli soldiers. Um, there was a huge political backlash, and the Israeli military drafted this secret field procedure to prevent future kidnappings. Um, it was designed not only to eliminate the soldiers' capture, captors, but possibly the soldier himself. In Shujaia and Rafa, the Hannibal Directive was applied not only to deliberately kill two Israeli soldiers, depriving their parents of the opportunity to agitate for their release in a politically controversial prisoner swap, and um, providing us with a very strong commentary on the extent to which Israel values the life of its own citizens. But as an, ex an, as an ostensible mechanism for revenge on the entire civilian population, in Shujaia, the capture of Sergeant Shaul Oron of the Golani Brigades following an attack on an armored personnel carrier triggered the attack on Shujaia that left the neighborhood devastated. This was the result of the invocation of the Hannibal Directive. I collected testimonies from three of the soldiers that were there that night. And this is the story they told me about the 20th of July and the killing of Salam, <clears throat> I'm sorry, of Salam Shamali, 23, that was killed there, only one of many in Sajaya that night. They are getting into the houses and getting the houses ready to make sure that they are ready for the next orders. The position of the sniper is already down and the sniper is lying in the position. The sniper is lying and when the sniper is lying, the officer commanding the house is getting to the soldiers and tell them they're going to create a red imaginary line outside in the rubbles, between the rubbles of Gaza. And whoever will cross this red imaginary line in the sand will be shot immediately because he is in a threat to the soldiers themselves in the house. But this time the soldiers themselves 
are saying something very weird. They're saying that the red imaginary line was drawn very, very far, a few hundred meters from the house, obviously not a threat to the soldiers, obviously a red line that was prepared there to kill whoever will cross the neighborhood again. The soldiers are getting their orders and waiting. In 10 a.m., they're getting the first briefing. In the first briefing, they will get an official order to what was until then a non-official hearsay. The officer is coming to the soldier, collecting them and telling them, I know that you are hurting the death of your 13 friends. I know that you're confused. I know that you're afraid and I know that you are frustrated. But don't worry. Your friends did not die in vain. We will let you to take out your frustration soon enough. At 3.30 p.m., Salam Halil Shamali, 23, son of the neighborhood, is coming back to the neighborhood after fleeing the night before. He's coming back with international solidarity group with him, American and European and other Palestinian people from Gaza that are looking for their family members. They're looking for family members they left behind between the rubbles. They're screaming out names of, fellow, of family members, hoping that they can find them alive. When they're entering into the alleyway where Salam's house was until last night still built, the building was completely ruined. They're crossing the alley. Salam is screaming the name of his family member. And then a shot is being shot directed to them. Until today, we do not know from which house was the shot aimed. And we do not know if it was supposed to be a warning shot from a conscious soldier or it was a shot that was tried to kill someone but didn't succeed. All of the group was going to different sides of the alley and hiding. After a minute, Salam got up and decided he cannot stop looking for family in the rubbles in Sajayi. So he starts screaming again the names of his family member and crossing again the alley. The sniper in the window, underneath the window in the house, is seeing Salam Halil Shamali in front of him and is asking a permission to kill him because he crossed with one foot the red imaginary line. The officer in the house is telling him, wait, he's turning off his radio and then giving him a permission to shoot him once. The sniper shot him once on the left side of his body and his hand. Salam falls immediately to the ground in the house. The sniper is asking for another permission to finish him off. The officer is telling him, wait, wait, and then giving him a permission to shoot him twice. Two shots are being shot from the sniper to the middle of his body, and he died immediately. The, the, soldier, the, the officer is congratulating the soldier, the sniper on the ground. He's turning on his radio, and they're continuing their day. In Rafa, the Hannibal Directive was invoked after the capture by a Qassam Brigade's ambush team one, a half hour before a humanitarian ceasefire was to begin of Lieutenant Hadar Golden, who had led a unit of the Gavati Brigade's elite paratrooper unit 101 in occupying a civilian home, which would have been a violation of the ceasefire agreement. This was the day that residents of Rafa know as Black Friday. As soon as the phrase Hannibal Blared across Israeli army radios, the Israeli military bombarded Rafa with almost every mode of destruction available to it, from F-16 missiles to Apache rockets to naval shelling to drone strikes to a rain of mortar shells. Bulldozers ripped down homes near the area where the capture of Golden took place, while tanks barreled through neighborhoods, shelling anything in sight. In a matter of hours, at least 500 artillery shells and hundreds of missiles were dumped on the city, almost entirely in civilian areas. By the end, at least 190 people had been killed, including Golden, apparently, which was the objective, though his condition was unclear at the time of his capture. When the Israeli military threatened to bomb Rafa's Najar 
Hospital, hundreds of dead and wounded were forced to evacuate to Kuwaiti Hospital, a tiny dental and OBGYN clinic with 20 beds, where Dr. Samir Al-Homs told me he was forced to carry out amputations and operations in the hallways and the floors of, of, of the hospital to store body parts and dead bodies, including children, in ice cream coolers and meat lockers. Gaza City, it's Tuesday the 19th of August, we've been out filming in Shijaya earlier today um, and unfortunately on returning to my hotel, Israel were reporting that three rockets were fired by Hamas into Israel. Everyone is, here is on tenter hooks waiting for the sound of a bomb or a rocket or anything else. We heard nothing, we saw nothing. I find it really difficult to believe that those rockets were launched. Nevertheless, Israel is, is using this as a pretext to launch further attacks on Gaza. And given what I've shown you to date, the idea that Israel is now bombing these same areas that we've seen that are already so devastated with people living under sheets and blankets is to me beyond all conscience. Shit. Okay, so um, the light bombing that, that just happened um, was actually Israel bombing a graveyard which is just uh, 300 meters from, from the hotel. Shit. So they're bombing close enough, but you just felt the shockwave come through the curtains. I really hope that came through on the camera, but the shockwave of the, of the blast actually came through and blew open the curtains. So I've, I've just done uh, tonight's live stream. It was really, really hard to do. Um, uh, in the middle there was shelling and I stopped momentarily because you can actually hear kids, uh, children screaming from nearby. It's just really scary. It's just relentless. It's absolutely relentless. I don't I don't know how how people cope with this all of the time. You know, I just jumped when a fly went past. You know, that's that's the level of, of tenter hooks uh, that I'm on and I've been here before under these conditions. Um so this is not the first time I've heard bombers drop on drop on Gaza or Palestine. Uh, but this just feels like a whole other a whole other level of horror that I've never seen or witnessed. It's so loud when they come, the bombs are so loud. Everything shakes and you're just praying that nothing's gonna fall on you and that nothing's destroyed. It's gonna be a really long night. So it's the, uh, the morning after the night before. Um, 
absolutely shattered and did manage to get some sleep but um, quite heavily interrupted with explosions, 12 people died overnight, 5 of them children, 3 of them women, one of the women was 32 weeks pregnant. I just don't know what the hell is, how everyone else is coping um, out there. So that, that's the state of things right now. Um, I've just done an interview with Al Khatib um, news station. Um, we're now driving through uh, Gaza City. It's the 21st of August. Um, heavy, heavy strikes last night, so we're going to try and um, get get ourselves to where some of the damage um, was done last night. It's very dangerous. None of the media at the moment uh, locally are going anywhere near um, the worst hit areas because they are just so dangerous. <laughs> been bombed overnight in the heart of Gaza City. People are still praying. You've got to ask who they're praying to. It doesn't sound like anybody's listening right now. It's just complete and utter devastation and in the last, since the ceasefire broke on Tuesday, there has barely been a period longer than 15 minutes where there hasn't been a shell, uh, a, a, a missile from an F-16, we've had artillery fire coming from tanks and from gunboats that are positioned off of the west coast. It has been constant, it's been relentless and this is very much the reality of life in Gaza right now. Life is lived in seconds, it's lived in minutes. Nobody here can really say they're certain they will live to pass the next hour. Israel is keeping Gaza constantly under threat and under an existential threat, not knowing whether they will live or die. That's the reality here. Now we're going to go to Al Shifa Hospital and see some of the victims of last night's attack. Israel will continue to attack one million children that live here in the Gaza Strip. Of 1.8 million people that live here, one million of them are under the age of 18. This is truly the war on children and this is one of its victims. If you are eight years today and born in Gaza, you have sustained four Israeli attacks, 2006, 9, 12, and 14. What does that do to a child's development, to a child's feeling of security, to a child's outlook of the world? And again, the resilience of the, of, of the Palestinian system, of the families, of, of the way they take care of each other, is the only protection they have against pure madness, pure, you know, insanity, because this is ongoing as the world, world is looking at it. And these children have had it actually, if you're eight years, four times now. They said that uh, they hope that uh, you would to tell your people that uh, here we are people. We just not not just tell you that we not help. No, block us like a brother for you and help us more. And please, uh, we don't need uh, every two years or, or three years a new war. So please, they want to be live in peace and uh, they want to just uh, renew her building, but not renew her, her, her building and he was afraid, oh, I renew now, tomorrow it will be destroyed again. That's yes. a big problem, you know, it's not yes. a life. So uh, here, every people here, when here, British, they feel sad. They say that because 
they, they see us in the television, every British people don't see us, just see the Israeli people. And they see us not good and the Israeli people good. This is, take your photo and tell your, your states what's happening really. Anyone speaking about an Israeli left for a peace movement is either lying or delusional. Uh, there are only a handful of dissidents, that's all we have, and they're all anti-Zionist, with no exception. Because as I mentioned, those who are Zionists are supremacists. There are exactly two types of Zionists. Okay. The outright fascists, the, those who are racist and proud of it, they say this is ours. Uh, and we don't care about Palestinian rights. And they're proud of it. There was an ethnic cleansing, and that's a good thing. The other form of Zionists are those who are implicitly fascist. So they're just as racist, just as supremacist, but they speak a different discourse. They speak the language of human rights and about peace. And they are, by the way, the ones who are usually being sent by the Foreign Affairs Ministry to, 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 to rebrand Israel. And they are the ones who are trying to legitimize the illegitimate. Now, these people who claim to be supportive of uh, peace and Palestinian rights would only support ending the conflict, would only support Palestinian rights under their own terms. As if they're in a position to come up with any. Yeah. Israel has precisely and exactly zero rights over that land. It only has obligation to the people living there. Discussing two states in Israel-Palestine is, is um, quite ridiculous because Israel and Palestine are the same place. It's a fictitious idea that there are two different entities, which is Israel and Palestine, in order to create a Palestinian something on one side and preserve the ethnic supremacy state of Israel on the other. And the only, the only <coughs> argument between the so-called left wing in Israel and the right wing is about the size of the land that will be a supremacist apartheid state. The most radical thing I can do in Israel is to speak about equality. And why is that? Because Israel was founded on everything that is opposed to equality. Israel should be changed into a normal state. That's all. From a Jewish state to be the state of all its citizens. And the state should be neutral. And if you pray, if you don't pray, it's, it's your problem. This should not be the business of the state. It's strange when you sit here, you wonder why that's such a controversial idea. You think, well, what is so controversial about a state where everyone is equal that recognizes everyone's rights? It's really not very radical. Anybody who expects a change from within Israeli society is living in, in, in denial. It will not come from them. The only way to make it happening is when the Israelis will start to pay for the occupation, will start to be punished for it. Yeah. Don't forget also that the Israelis build themselves a protection wall against international intervention, namely tagging every criticism as anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. and by this pushing the responsibility to the other side and the blame. Mm -hmm. It's not our blame, it's the world's blame. So until it will get into really practical steps which will make the Israelis think, are we ready to pay this for the occupation? Only then a change might happen. This is the Dachia doctrine go live. As uh, the uh, commander uh, Yolov Galant said uh, on the second day of the uh, onslaught during Kastled, he said the aim of the Israeli attack should be to send Gaza decades into the past while at the same time attaining the maximum number of civilian casualties and keeping IDF casualties at the minimum. So the Dachia doctrine, ladies and gentlemen, it is to cause as much damage as possible, destroy, kill and maim as many people as possible without losing any of your own. This is a doctrine and this is actually what we see on the ground in Gaza. They should have our full support, the Palestinian people, and they are depending on you now. The word Sumud, which sums up which really embodies Palestinian culture and means steadfastness, is not used lightly. Um, these are people who resist. These are strong people and you can resist too. And you should resist too. As I leave for home, I'm feeling moved nearly to the point of tears by the courage of the Palestinian people. So determined to keep their humanity, compassion, joy and dignity intact 
against all the odds. It is simply not acceptable for this extraordinary people to stay locked in a cruel and violent occupation. They are guilty of only one thing, being the wrong race in an apartheid state. I'm left too with a sadness for Israel. The real threat to Israel is not homemade projectiles fired from Gaza in desperation. Israel has a much bigger problem. It cannot be a Jewish state and a democracy. To remain a Jewish state, it must import Jews and exile non-Jews. Such a system of apartheid makes democracy impossible. Today, Israel is imploding under the weight of its own fascism. Its people raised in a heady cocktail of fear and supremacy. The solution is clear and it is not the smokescreen of a two-state solution. When we opposed South African apartheid, we didn't propose partitioning South Africa, handing the major cities to the whites and offering sovereignty over the ghettos and Bantustans to the blacks. This is not a conflict. It is the same colonial occupation and it must be dismantled in its entirety. One state with equality and dignity for all its people. Once, Britain stood up to fascists. Today, we legitimise them. We are on the wrong side of history and only we can make the difference. Our governments are not interested, so it's on us. We can resist and we must. Sometime between ice ages that they first appeared so Fell hungry on the beasts and fish they speared um, so all their bones are black and their faces are no more as we walk among the ruins by the shore Hello. They worshipped gods and thought they'd never die But now the spiders nest the tombs Wherein they lie But all their bones are black and their faces are no more as we walk among the ruins by the shore. They dreamed of golden cities raised into the air, but green And their faces are no more As we walk among the ruins by the shore King's time on the earth elsewhere Their belief in 
But all their bones are blackened And their faces are no more As we walk among the ruins by the shore And the silent skies Hoping that light will fall On blinded eyes But all our bones will blacken And our faces be no more As we lay among the ruins by the shore as we lay 